just, just you know, I, I know a lot of you know about Michter's already, but just a little bit about uh, Michter's. Uh, lots of history. Uh, it, it, tra it wasn't called Michter's then, but it traces back to America's first whiskey distillery, uh, founded in 1753 um, uh, in Shakerstown, Pennsylvania. It was originally called uh, Shanks, uh, later called Bomberger's in the 1800s, kept changing its name. Um, it eventually became uh, famous as Michter's in the 1950s, and it, it, it's not actually a German name. It's the Lou Foreman put together Michael and Peter as two kids' names, Michter's, not German. And um, they made really good whiskey. Um, we began, um, well, they made really good whiskey, you know, and, and when I started in the business, I'm a lot older than, 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 than you guys. Uh, when I started in the business, in the 1970s, 80s, and even into the 90s, uh, the whiskey business was the exact opposite of what it is right now. Um, it basically was in, a, in the equivalent of depression. Um, and um, you know, if, you, if you were selling whiskey, you know, I know one of my breakthrough friends is here, former breakthrough friends. If you were selling whiskey, uh, uh, if you were down 15 percent, you know, you were doing a good job because the other guy was down 17 percent. Um, uh, you know, so things. Uh, Michter's, like some other really good companies, failed um, financially. They uh, uh, they went bankrupt in 1989, um, and, uh, and and Michter's Pennsylvania shut, and they basically sold everything off. Um, uh, it was an abandoned brand. I mean, nobody nobody wanted anything to do with it. Um, and in the mid 1990s, our group um, uh, our group uh, filed for the abandoned trademark, and we restarted it. I I actually was very familiar with Michter's because uh, as a summer job uh, in 1978, while I was in college, um, I sold Michter's for the uh, uh, New York Michter's distributor. So I was very familiar with Michter's, always liked it, I bartended in college, really liked it, um, knew about the history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we set to work in the uh, mid-90s to uh, work on bringing Michter's back. We went through three stages of production. The first stage of production, we had nothing to do with making it. Uh, first stage of production, basically, um, you know, Kentucky was awash with great whiskey, and we went around to distilleries that were overloaded with stuff that they couldn't get rid of. Uh, when they heard that we wanted only 10 year and older stuff, they were thrilled because there was no market for older American whiskeys now. There was virtually, in those days, there was almost no market for expensive American whiskeys in those days. Um, and uh, when they heard that we wanted rye, they really did the happy dance because nobody wanted rye uh, in those days. Uh, so it's very, very different than now. So stage one, uh, uh, yeah, Dick Newman, who was my consultant and one of my mentors in the business, Dick had run Old Taylor Oak Pro and Old Grand Ave National Distillers and later became uh, president of Boston Nichols and Nickel Wild Turkey. Um, and so he knew Kentucky really well. We went around, tasted at different distilleries, lots of great stuff in Kentucky then, lots of great stuff in Kentucky now. But basically, we picked a style of whiskey that we really liked ourselves and wanted to emulate, you know, God willing, if the brand ever had traction and we ever started making ourselves. Um, 2003, we started working with a Kentucky company. Um, I'm not allowed to say who it is because I, they don't work with a lot of people and I have to sign a confidentiality as a condition of working with them. Uh, but basically, uh, like everybody else, they were operating, you know, under capacity, and um, they were willing to have a certain number of days per year be Michter's days. And uh, so we call that our phase two. Our phase two, we were technically still a non-distiller producer because we didn't own the bricks and mortar. However, you know, it was a lot more than uh, uh, than, 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 than most non-distiller producers. Basically. Um, you know, we were using the same recipes we use now, the same yeast we use now. Um, you know, at, at, at that distillery, we started barreling 103 proof, which uh, basically nobody else I'm familiar with in America does uh, uh, for all that stuff the way that we do. So we did a lot of different stuff um, that um, made the whiskey pretty special. And we basically, thanks, thanks Alicia. Um, and uh, so uh, what I likened it to was, you know, we were like a chef that couldn't afford his own restaurant yet, uh, but went and cooked in somebody else's kitchen. Um, fast forward to 2012, we then had the resources to do a distillery in the right way. Uh, we became a licensed distillery in the Shively section of Louisville. Any of you guys, I mean, these guys, these guys probably live at the distillery. <laughs> uh, but any of you guys visited or, or 
So, yes, yeah, so, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, and so we, we have a distillery uh, in the Shively section of Louisville. It's one of our three operations in Kentucky. Uh, it's our main operation. It's uh, uh, 78,000 square feet uh, on 12.8 on acres. Um, we have uh, a, a second distillery, the Fort Nelson building that we are opening downtown. We're hoping uh, end of September, beginning of uh, October to be open to the public. Uh, our main distillery is, you, you, you guys are friends and family. Um, our main distillery is not open to the public, but obviously any of you, we, we're, we're honored that you're here today. Any of you, or if you have friends that want to come visit, please let one of us know. Um, um, the downtown facility, Fort Nelson building, which is a gorgeous historic building right opposite Louisville Slugger Bat Factory in downtown Louisville, uh, that will be open to the public. We'll actually be distilling there um, with the uh, legendary pot still system from Nictus, Pennsylvania, which we were fortunate enough to be able to purchase. Um, it's, uh, you know, in our Shively distillery, we're typical, traditional, good Kentucky distillation, column still to pot. Um, and whereas whereas uh, uh, the Michter's Pennsylvania system uh, it, it, it is pot to pot, you know, beer still to spirit still to both pot. Um, so we have maybe some interesting things off that. We have three Cypress with fermenters from uh, Michter's, and um, you know, they made some pretty legendary stuff on that system. Uh, so we're very, very excited about that. It sort of gives us more capabilities. Um, we also went, in terms of planning for the future, we went and uh, at the end of 17, we purchased 145 acres in Springfield, Kentucky. Uh, it's really beautiful, it has springs on the property. Um, and, and there, we've already started farming. Uh, we'll be farming some of our own estate grown grain for uh, uh, special products that we do. And we'll also learn a little bit more about it by farming some of the stuff ourselves. We were very, very, very particular about the grain that we source. Um, all all non-GMO, obviously, uh, in our case, which is not the norm in Kentucky. Um, and um, anyway, but we'd love to have you know any people come back because it'll look a little different than the last time you were there, especially when we opened Fort Nelson. Um, and um, um, you know, right now we're selling uh, around the U.S. Uh, we're selling in. I took a look at it last week. Fifty-four foreign jurisdictions. Um, um, you know, we, we kind of have to allocate, we're literally allocating everything that we uh, uh, make at this point. Uh, we're trying to ramp up production, but you know, one of the things that we do is, um, you know, one of, one of the advantages that we have uh, is that ownership, you know, Catherine's, you know, father, mother, brother, um, they've said to me, if there's anything that you know to do, or you people know to do to make the whiskey better, don't worry about your cost of goods sold. And we really push that hard. We do a lot of stuff that, you know, we'll talk about some of it today as we taste. We do a lot of stuff that, that, that really uh, is costly and out of the norm, but we think gives us stylistically a little different whiskey. Um, you know, all, all, all sorts of different stuff. Uh, uh, you know, uh, our wood, you know, there, there's some wonderful uh, special releases that people have done. Uh, one, was, one from a great company was great, about having 13 month air dry wood for the special release. Um, for our U.S. ones, at least expensive types, our wood is air dried 18 months minimum, uh, not 13 months of course, before it's made into a maker's barrel. Um, um, you know, uh, obviously American whiskey, you have to char the barrels for bourbon, you have to char the barrels for American wine, but we toast them beforehand. Um, you know, a, a maker's barrel costs about $55 more a piece than a, than a standard good new Kentucky barrel does. Um, you know, uh, uh, probably the single mode, you know, we heat cycle our warehouses, um, and that's uh, basically for a period of time. Um, what we will do is, is the temperature change that makes the whiskey soak in and out of the barrel, and you basically get four to six significant temperature changes in an average Kentucky brick house in an average Kentucky year. Uh, we will induce extra cycles. When it's cold outside, Kentucky gets quite cold in the, in the winter time. When it's cold outside, we will heat up uh, the, the barrel warehouses to about 90 degrees Senate, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm presenting in Scandinavia, let's get off. Uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 30 degrees centigrade. Um, and uh, we'll heat it up for a, a week or over a week, and then we'll open the windows. And so we induce extra cyclings in and out, so more interaction with the sugars and the wood and the red wine and the wood. 
the reason that, you know, we're not the only ones who do that, but the reason most people don't want to do that is that your angel share of evaporation goes through the roof and it gets very, very, very expensive. Um, and, and, and probably the very single most expensive thing that we do is we barrel at 103 proof. Um, you know, industry standard in Kentucky now is about 120 to 125 proof. Uh, we barrel at a much lower barrel in proof. Um, and the advantage of that is that we think that the whiskey ages, you know, richer and better. That's really expensive. You know, the thing that, you know, obviously the more concentrated the alcohol, the more bottles you get out of the same barrel. And, 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 and people don't necessarily realize it, but to get a Mictor's barrel, a standard Kentucky barrel, it uh, costs more than the white dog you put into it. So if you can save on the number of barrels by having fewer barrels, more concentrated liquid, and produce the same number of bottles with fewer barrels, you save a lot of money. You save a lot of money. We don't do that. Uh, Willie Pratt, our master distiller emeritus, um, uh, you know, really what started in 1964 in the industry of making bourbon. And um, you know, Willie said, Joe, you know, if you really, if you're serious about quality, it's going to be expensive, but uh, you should barrel 103 proof. And, and the better bourbons in the 50s and the 60s were all barreled around 103 proof. Um, and, and basically, if you start at 103 proof, after, after six years, it'll be 110 proof roughly. If you start at 100, 125 proof, like most other people do, after six years, it'll be 140. Now, you're ready to bottle. You want to make a, want to make a nice 90 proof bourbon you know, bottled out of this. The 110 proof stuff, when you bottle it, you have to add a lot less last minute water than you do 140 proof stuff. And in fact, we were in the process of quantifying it for our tour at Fort Nelson, and it's roughly, basically, we add, we add roughly half the amount of last minute water at bottling that another that, that the companies uh, with the standard uh, 125 barrel and proof do. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and you know, they're, they're chem most of the chemistry goes right over my head, but, but one of the things I do remember is that basically, you know, there's also a chemical explanation of the polyphenol compounds in the, in the whiskey, which can sort of give like a burn and some sort of a tannic note to whiskey, uh, those dissolve much, much, much better, um, um, you know, with it where there's a little bit more water. Um, and, and when you, and one of the things, are we gonna do the 125 and 103? Yes. Yeah. One of the things you'll, you'll taste today is you'll taste, you'll taste uh, our, our rye, uh, US1 rye, same bottling proof, the only same, same day, same part of the rick house, same age, same type of barrel. The only difference will be that one was put in the barrel originally at 103 versus the other put in the barrel at 125. Um, so, uh, you know, whether, whether we're doing it or not, our goal is to make the greatest American whiskey. Uh, and uh, we have a really good team there. Um, uh, um, actually, speaking of Scotch, Andrea Wilson, our master of maturation, she worked at Diageo for years and years and years. She was the of distillation and maturation at Diageo in North America. Uh, fantastic company. Um, um, and uh, she actually worked at Crown Royal Distillery, which eventually reported to her. Um, and um, um, they worked with uh, reported to her, et cetera. And then we also have Pam Heilman, our master distiller. Pam um, um, ran the largest bourbon distillery in the world for Jim for eight years, with uh, 23 distillers reporting to her. Um, so uh, we don't have a big team. You know, Dan, Dan McKee, who is our uh, distiller and vice president of production, is, is brilliant. He's a brilliant young guy. He was Pam's right hand at Beam um, and would be a great master distiller someday. Um, and, um, you know, again, when you come down, I know these guys have gotten to spend some time. These guys, he even worked in the distillery. Next time, they're going to put you in the distillery. So, uh, uh, but, um, you know, we have an interesting operation. We do things a little bit differently than most people do. Um, and please ask me any, you know, questions, you know, whatsoever, and uh, you should try some whiskey. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, I love that you're going into the barrel at a lower proof. I think that's so important. I'm curious, are you coming off the still, or your engineers, you come off the still at a lower proof too? It, that, that, is, that is a great question. Um, um, the answer is, you know, we, we come off the still 
I don't know whether I'm kind of allowed to say the exact proof, um, but 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 we, we you know, one of the things that would always surprise me is that it, 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 it is is how little the proof goes up on the second distillation in the pot when you go from a column. Um, but but um, we we come off not I wouldn't say super low, but we come off lower than a lot of people do. Obviously, for bourbon, it has to be a hundred less than one hundred and sixty. Um, and, and we're 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 always lower than that. But but one of the and and you know these all. I'm not. I love I love whiskey. I'm not a production person. I don't pretend to be a production person. Um, um, but I know there's a lot of different factors in terms of like you know what the white dogs are come off at. I think I think that I, I know that we, we do two things. We actually, which is which is you know we're very fortunate for for a small distillery. We have two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment that takes the chemical fingerprint of the white dog, and we always do that when it comes off the still. Um, and we, we have a gas chromatograph, mass spectrometer, and we also have a high pressure liquid chromatograph. And, and those those two tests you know, measure thousands of things, take a fingerprint of the whiskey. Uh, when I say whiskey, I mean the distill before we barrel it. And when it comes off at the particular proof, and, and there is in fact a very particular proof that typically both our rye and our bourbon come off at, um, that, that, that Pam and Andrea and Dan really want. Uh, so it, it, it's a very calculated amount. And again, I apologize, but I'm not sure I'm supposed to give the exact number. <laughs> um, um, but but um, uh, you know, it, things have to pass the chemist the chemistry fingerproof test, and if it passes that, then we have 17 people who have been formally trained uh, in breaking down whiskey taste, um, and, and and it has to pass the panel. It's not not all 17 they rotate, um, but it's, it's always Pam, it's always uh, Dan, um, and it ha has to pass the panel. Um, and if it doesn't pass both tests, we send it off to parallel products across the street, and it gets made into fuel ethanol for pennies on a dollar. Um, we don't we don't use it if it's not really 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 right. But and, and it's interesting to me too because you know I, I said I was really surprised it doesn't happen that often. Every once in a while, the chemical fingerprint is fine, but then it just doesn't smell or taste the same. Doesn't happen that much, but you know. And I said, I said to Andrew Wilson, who who is a master's degree in chemical engineering. So Andrew, how does this happen? And she said, you know, we measure for like a thousand or so, sort of like of the typical suspects that affect whiskey tastes, and they're going to be affect how it mature and stuff like that. But you know, there's maybe you know two hundred thousand things that we're not measuring for. Because they're not sort of the typical things that would influence the white dog flavor and how it's going to mature. But you know, sometimes those things we're not measuring for can be different. And that's why you really still need the human touch. So, any other questions before we drink? Let's drink. 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 So, end the video for now. And um, so the first, the first two that we're going to do. Um, Oh, and just and I, I, and and, and um, um, Catherine Malioko is our is our vice president uh, at at at, uh, at, at, uh, at Michter's. Um, um, Will is interning for us this this summer, um, so so we actually have some brain power for change at Chatham. John Holtzinger, uh, John, uh, John John before joining us was was uh, part of the management at the Bourbon and Branch in San Francisco, uh, amazing place. Uh, he's, he's an extraordinarily bright young man. Um, he runs New York State, which is a very big market for us, but he also is, is a whiskey specialist because he knows so much and does a lot of work for us, really, not just here, but around the world. Um, um, and, and Lily O'Connell is our director of marketing and does a great job, uh, and he works with us from time to time. So um, uh, let's see, the first two things. Um, the left, this is our US one wrong. Both are at 84.8, but the one at the left was barreled at 103 proof uh, originally, and the one at the right was barreled at 125 proof. 
and just see if one seems to have a little more, you know, burn or not. I mean, they, even even if you, I, I, if I could ask you, please nose them first, so that you can even tell a difference in the nose. Yeah. They're a bit different. Even, you know, even before you taste them, they're a bit different. And the black paper cups are spit cups in case anyone doesn't want to drink all of this. Who would do that? <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys have a long day of tasting ahead of you, so no pleasure. My wife thanks you. <laughs> <laughs> Still, did you try both ways? No, I didn't. I didn't have it at We both of these. We had. Uh, we didn't have that. We didn't do the shanks. We did almost everything else. So. But yeah, you can definitely feel the burn. <laughs> I was still yeah. last September. Last September. Yeah. The warehouse, literally side by side. Um, Dumped the same day, etc. But you know, the, the, there is there is a bit of a difference. Wait, the 103 has a much more pure sugary note than the 125. I think it's a good way to describe it. You know, one, you know, one thing that Steve Ziegler, who you know, like me, he's not a production person, but he um, uh, he loves whiskey. He always says, like, you know, with mixers, you know, you, uh, stylistically, you know, we want to be rich, we want to be a little bit sweet, but you know, we want to have some, some, uh, have some heat, but really not a burn. Um, then, um, have, have all you guys had the right before? Yes. So now, now, now we're going to our US1 bourbon top, the uh, uh, second from the right. Um, and. This is a small batch product. Um, I don't know what the rules are or aren't, and in, 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 I, I love scotch. Um, I don't know what the rules are, but it, in the US, basically, all that small batch means legally is that it has to be smaller than your biggest batch. Um, and so if you're, you know, so if, 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 if you would normally batch 4,000 barrels, and some people do, if you batch two or three thousand, that can be your small batch legally, and, and, and it's you know it's fine from a legal point of view. Um, um, so this is, but we are really really small batch. You know, our equipment is sized on purpose so that our batching tanks will not hold more than twenty full barrels, period. Um, and the thing is, you know, I, I was very good friends with um, um, uh, very friends. Uh, with, with some of the people at, 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 at Wild Turkey, uh, Jim Rutledge is a great distiller, and um, you know, Jim was very open. His his, his four roses uh, small batch was typically around 375 barrels to 400 barrels, and and it's a great product. But if even with a few hundred barrels, if you have one barrel enough, you how good your distillery is. And again, I know Kentucky, I don't know I don't know Scotch, but no matter how good your distillery is you're gonna get a barrel once in a while that's musty. And that will never go away, no matter how old it is. You will once in a while get a barrel that's too woody, even at a young age. So, so, and the thing is, if you get a few bad barrels and throw them in at 500, 600, it'll throw it off, but it's still gonna be pretty good. If you get one barrel that's not just right out of 20, it's horrible. I mean, it really sucks. So, so, we do that on purpose with really small batches because our people know that if every barrel isn't right, they really can't use it because the whole thing would be just, just terrible. So in the course of a year, how many barrels do you think you don't use that don't come off right? Because you said it's, that, it's, that it's, is it's a, small. That, 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 well, no, 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 no. That, 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 that is, that is um, that the, the small thing is when you, is when you, is, is the white dog, when the white dog, when the chemistry doesn't match the organic um, This, this, it, it's a, I mean, it, 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 it's a fair, it, it's, not a, it's not a ton, but it, you know, it, 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 it happens, it happens. Yeah, so I'm giving you a vague answer, so I'm giving you an exact one on that one. But, but, but it's, it, it, it's more than I wish it was. Um, but, um, 
you know, and our people really, you know, there aren't that many people, there aren't that many companies uh, that, that, you know, taste the stuff as much as we do. Um, you know, and there's all sorts of other things. You know, one, one of the things, you know, the Scotch people especially, you know, they will debate, you know, uh, and a lot of Scotch people think that, you know, uh, uh, chill filtration is not good, uh, although a lot of people do think it's good. Um, when it comes to our product, we think that there's no substitute for chill filtration. And the thing is, when you visit us, I mean, when you empty, a, you know, we, bourbon, by law, first use charred barrel. When, you know, American rye, by law, first use charred barrel. When you empty it, you have all this stuff that comes out, and you guys have seen it in this story, and so if you have all this stuff that comes out, you know, I, I, I have friends who worked in Scotland, you know, one of them worked at a place where some of the barrels that were, were being reused for over 30 times. Now, we're using the tea bag the first time. So we're a different animal than, than, than scotch, where maybe it's being used the third time, the fifth time, the tenth time, or the thirtieth time, uh, depending on what they're trying to accomplish. You know. Very good um, selling point. What's that? Very good selling point. No, but, but, it, but it really, it, it's, you know, so, so for that, we really firmly believe that chill filtration is the right way to go. And one of the other things that we do is, you know, we're not efficient, and we're kind of proud of it. Um, if you were if you were at most Kentucky distilleries, they pick one filtration methodology that's good and they use it in everything. We're different. What we found, you know, Willie Pratt, our national emeritus, you know, who's a great guy and still you know comes in and goes as he pleases, um, um, Willie did an experiment roughly about ten years ago now that blew my mind. He took he took whiskey from the same barrel and filtered it 32 different ways from the same barrel in our lab. And, and you know, and well, 32 different ways. Well, was the mesh tighter? Was it looser? Was it coated with, you know, perlite, which is finely crushed seashells? Was it coated with diatomaceous earth, which is used in a lot of, you know, good beverage filtration? Or was it coated with nothing? So all these different, 32 different permutations. It was shocking, the whiskey from the same barrel, you know, one of them looked like weak tea and smelled like turpentine. And another filtration, the same exact whiskey from the same barrel, it was, it was, it was you know, beautiful caramel color and rich and vanilla and just beautiful. Um, and and, and it, it just really showed us how important the filtration is. And that's another thing. So what we, and what we also found is that the filtration that works best on our US-1 bourbon is different than the filtration methodology that works best on a US-1 rye. The filtration methodology that works best on a US-1 rye is different than the filtration methodology that works best on our 10-year rye. So what we do is we kind of stop the presses. We're not efficient. We can't run through as much. We also need, need really bright people working for us because it's more involved rather than just do it the same time, same way all the time. You know, we will filter in the best particular way for that particular whiskey that we are filtering. Um, and that's one of the things that, that really does have a very, very big effect. And when you come to the distillery, we can actually have you taste the same thing filtered two different ways. And again, it's, it, it, it's, it's really a bit of an education. Um, it's so interesting, because I would say, like, probably like, and tell me if you guys disagree, but I think that the, the consensus as far as like in the magazines and whatever, the cool kids of whiskey think that, that non-filtered is better because they're congeners or whatever, I'm no scientist, that you lose in the filtration process. But we recently had an event with an, uh, one of the majors in Kentucky that was also championing uh, filtering. And actually, I was shocked when that happened, but this is yeah. the second time now that yeah. I, this runs counter to what I would have thought would have been. It, 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 it is counterintuitive. And, we, and we've done stuff where we don't filter it, and et cetera. You know, put put aside, put aside. You know the the the, the, the yeast swirl that you can get, and, and and you especially remember now, guys. You know, we, we like to have our US ones be around six years old. You know, and, and and the older your whiskey is, and then especially when you heat cycle, cycled, tastes like our nine year old unheat cycled. 
and, and Andrea Wilson, our master of maturation, really believe that basically you pick up a year and a half for every year that you, you, you do the heat cycle. So we pick up a lot more stuff from the wood. And, and, and so you can pick up stuff there that, that, that cosmetically can look not good for people that don't know better. They see the yeast swirl, they think it's dark, they think it's Al Qaeda, they don't think it's, you know, mm -hmm. a, uh, just you didn't unfiltered. Um, but put that aside. The other thing that's very counterintuitive, but that we found, you know, Willie, who, Willie, who you know, has been in the industry since 1964, he, he doesn't use the fancy chemistry you know, words that, you know, that Dan McKee would use or that Andrea would use. Um, but what he does say, he says, Joe, it's counterintuitive, but when you filter out the bad guys, it lets the good guys show up even more hmm. and show off more. And there's certain things that times that by taking certain harsher elements out of the whiskey through filtration, you can actually allow some of the really good stuff to really come to the forefront that otherwise is masked. So, you know, and, and I, I, I get it about, you know, filtering and this and that, and I filtering is really important and I respect unfiltered stuff, we've done unfiltered stuff, but it, you know, in our opinion, depending on the product, it's not always the best approach. That's, That's what we found. I mean, again, 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 I don't know Scotchwell. I love it, I love it, but, but I don't know Scotchwell, but, you know, Kentucky whiskey, our team has a lot of experience. A lot of experience. People are trying to, in terms of maturation, are literally trying almost everything to speed up the process or facilitate. Um, uh, Copper and King's Brandy in Kentucky, they do uh, sound maturation. They've got these big subwoofers in their barrel room and they literally they think that vibrating the barrels will age them faster. So, you know, it's, uh, this seems heating and opening up the window seems more practical, but, you know, yeah, people are... Yeah, I mean, it, 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 kind of that, music that, is, right? a, that yeah. is a more... We, and we, we are not... A lot of people don't... Most people don't do it, or, or if they do it, they only do it in their very expensive whiskeys. Um, that's something that's been around for a long time in Kentucky, but, you know, you, ultrasound, you're right, you know, they're, they're playing music, Ultrasound, uh, you know, putting on a boat that rocks. I mean, you know, you name it, you name it. The different, you know, it's kind of like you know pursuing the holy grail. I mean, look, if, if, if you know, if you could, if you could do something, you know, that 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 makes your two-year-old, you know, taste like six-year-old, you know, I mean, economically, you know, you're hitting the lottery. Um, you know, a, a lot of people, and, and, and they're very good products, but a lot of people use smaller barrels. Now, when you use a smaller barrel, you have more surface area for the amount of, 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 of whiskey that's, of the amount of distillates that's in the barrel. And when you have more surface area in a smaller barrel, you will get color more quickly, you will get some flavor more quickly, but, you know, you don't necessarily get the complexity that you do when you age longer in a bigger barrel, um, and so we're you know we're you know there's a lot of people making a lot of great stuff with a lot of different approaches, but that being said, stylistically there's a lot of traditional stuff that we really do believe in, and that's not that we keep doing everything the same way because we don't. Uh, we're always experimenting, but but um, we we haven't we haven't found that way to really make the stuff. You know, tastes great, really. Young, yeah. right. Chuck Cowdery got it right in his article. Small barrels make lousy whiskey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, and you know, but one, one of, the, I mean, I, 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 I Chuck, Chuck knows as much as anybody in the world about American whiskey. Um, I think, I think sometimes you can get like a really great flavor with with a small barrel, but. Was maybe it's a great flavor. It doesn't have the complexity. It doesn't change in your mouth. Maybe as much as something that's aged a long time does. But again, you know, the devil's in the details. I mean, a lot of people are making you know different stuff that's very very good. Um, um, top right is our sour mash. Okay, who's going to explain sour mash process? Why don't you? I, I'm not going to explain it. I, I just know I love it. Okay. <laughs> it, 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 it but nothing else. 
but, but you don't assume I took him out. So yeah. that, that, that I know it's my favorite of the bunch. I can't explain it. Oh, you can explain anything. You can explain anything. Um, it's a combination of your, your eye, your bourbon, that gives you the best of both worlds. Almost. But what salad mash is actually a process, and I don't remember, I don't know, if we, we, we have to try to remember the lady's name, what Pat uh, was saying. It was, it was credited to some guy, Dr. Crow, um, and it, it, in Kentucky in the 1800s, until about 10, 15 years, it was discovered it was actually a woman who came up with the process. It was Catherine some, yeah. So it wasn't, it wasn't actually Dr. Crow. Um, but basically, what they found is that, you know, obviously, you know, you're, you're basically fermenting a soup, your beer. Um, and, then, and, then, and then basically, sour mash process, in Kentucky, anywhere from 10 to 40% of what you're fermenting is from a previous fermentation. So taking what taking from previous fermentation, that's a sour mash methodology. And in Kentucky, again, it's typically anywhere from 10 to 40 percent. Um, it gives continuity uh, to the from one batch to another. It gives family continuity. Um, there is also chemistry that I apologize, I don't remember right now. I know, and I thought it. Yes, yeah, it's PA, Thank you. It, 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 it's a reason he's here. Uh, uh, it, 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 it helps regulate the pH um, in, in a way that's better for the fermentation. But now, the fact of the matter is that 99% of the good whiskey from Kentucky is sour mash process. And, and everything, we, we've done sweet mash, which is when you don't you know, take from a previous fermentation. We do that too, we haven't released anything, uh, but we've experimented with it. But our sour mash, we call it Make Your Sour Mash because it's Willie's, it was Willie's recreation of the most famous, um, of, of the most famous type of nickels um, from the 1970s and 80s. In the 70s and 80s, this was the best selling whiskey for Pennsylvania makers. Um, and um, some writers have written that it kind of starts sweet like a bourbon, but then it dries up a little bit like a, like with a little spice, a little dryness like a rye. Um, and um, it, it, it's kind of a special whiskey. Um, Michael Jackson's World Guide to Whiskey in 1988 um, wrote, and, and, and we, don't, we didn't have the mash bill. Uh, uh, we don't know exactly what the mash bill was for regional mixtures. Uh, Michael Jackson's World Guide to Whiskey in 1988 wrote that it was 38% corn. We always do corn first in Kentucky. 50%, 5-0% rye, and 12% barley malt. Um, Sam Kumlenic, I don't know if any of you guys know him. Sam is an editor and whiskey advocate, and he probably knows more about American rye and more about uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland rye than anybody in the world. Um, and um, he, he thinks Michael Jackson got it wrong with the percentages, but one thing that's very clear is that it clearly had a lot of rye in it. And, and some writers have actually said to me that they believe that Michter's stopped at 50% rye because in the 1970s, they were afraid that if they went to 51%, that the government, federal government, in those days ATF, regulated and not set TTB, ATF would have made them call it rye. And to put rye on the label was marketing death. Uh, so that's why they stopped at 50, according to certain uh, historians. Um, but this is our uh, salad dish. Best of both worlds, right? The people didn't understand why, or was it being sold as a cheap product back then? That's a really great question. I don't know enough. I mean, you know, it, uh, you know, if, if, if you speak to some people like uh, like like, like you know, Mike Veach, uh, who's, a, who's a historian, you know, why was enormous. Um, you know, uh, it, it was enormous before prohibition, um, and after prohibition. The American distillers, you know, corn is a cheaper grain than rye, and, and it's also it's, it's also easier to work with at the distillery. The rye sticks to your it sticks to your equipment. It foams up more than than, than when you ferment. It really gets a, a lot more foam than than than, 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 than corn does. Um, so it's harder to work with. And so so for economics and ease, the American companies started really concentrating on corn, uh, bourbon, um, but rye was huge. Um, whether it was that you know the quality of some of the rise went down, 
whether it was just considered, you know, your great grandfather's stuff. I, I, the answer is I don't know. I do know that when we decided to concentrate on rye uh, in, in the 1990s, originally we, we, we were even originally going to come out with just make this rye, not even do burger. Um, but um, uh, the, you know, distributors that we were calling on said, you know, you're a really nice guy, but you were very young, very dumb. Um, and you know, if you don't at least do bourbon, you're never going to sell anything. Um, um, but um, um, there were literally, there, I mean, there were literally three ryes that you could find. Um, you could find, and, and you had to look to find them. You could find Overholt, which is from Beam. You could find Beam from Beam, um, and you could find Wild Turkey. And some of these guys, you know, they, they would literally, they would maybe distill, maybe one day every couple of years, because it was so unpopular. Um, and, um, and, 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 you know, and they're, 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 they're very good products. Um, they're not like some of the ryes that are on the market nowadays, um, that are sort of more like the better old-fashioned ryes, and that's what we were trying to emulate. Um, so, but I, I really don't know. It's funny because it's my introduction to whiskey was making rye and ginger. You know, my great aunt, and you know, it was a Canadian club, rye right. and things like that. So, right. was there an association because rye was like more the Canadian type of inferior product? And that's a great point because you know what they call rye. Rye almost became. They do do a lot of rye in rye in Canada, but you know, they changed the definition. In the, 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 this used to be the Canadian statute. They used to say that you know you could add color, you can't do it to bourbon. You get flavor, you can't do it to bourbon. And the statute used to go on to say, and by the way, Canadian rye, you don't have, it doesn't have to contain any rye. Right. Right. So, but they called it rye, and so it was almost like a almost more like a category name, and 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 um, you know, and some of them were good. See, the other thing too is those whiskeys. You know those whiskeys, and we'll get to we'll get to our American. Those whiskeys, like a lot of American whiskeys, um, the rules. I mean, the, people obey the rules, but the rules were laxer. And the thing is, after you know, after prohibition, and also for economics continuing on, people wanted to stretch their whiskey. You know, they, they don't want to hold the whiskey four years, six years, eight years, whatever. And so to stretch it, they would add grain neutral spirits, GNS. Literally vodka, um, and, and and you can add that. You can still you can add up to American whiskey can be up to eighty nowadays still up to eighty percent grain neutral spirits and twenty percent real whiskey. Um, I don't know the exact percentages for Canadian. And my, my dad my dad would drink you know Canadian rye um, with ginger. Um, um, you know I don't know the exact percentage, but you could add a lot of GNS. A lot of grain neutral spirits to that too, and I think you know, and and, and for people, and again, there's a good place for that. Uh, you know, if you're going to mix it with Coca-Cola, you know, does it make a big difference? I don't know, but 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 for people that want a real quality thing, you know, it's not the same. No, it's not the same. I think it's changed. It's, yeah, basically. Now, middle left. This is this is Shanks. Which is, you know, again, uh, uh, Shanks was the original name in Mictors. Uh, and so we, we a couple of times a year, I think. I this think is Shanks. a new release? Because I know that you guys had released one. This, this, this has been released. Um, is this, this, this has to be, I think, last year's release? Yeah, this yeah. is not a new one yet, right? Which one? Well, guess what? <laughs> You, you're, you're gonna you're gonna taste you're gonna taste some stuff that's gonna be released. Uh, uh, it's released, I think, in September. Oh, oh, ooh, cheers! Ooh. Another Scotch and Time exclusive thing. <laughs> <laughs> and th no, sir, th this this release is typically uh, typically you know once or twice a year. This is gonna be the first release of this year. Hi, how you doing? Thanks for joining us. <laughs> no, no, no. Problem. Accidentally, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've been waiting for you. No, no, no. We're waiting for you. So we are up to. Uh, all right, you have to down. You have to down the top four immediately. All right, <laughs> and, and then we'll be. Uh, then we'll be at the middle left. You can watch Eric's videotape of the first four. That's right. I was watching it on the train. Okay. So, um, 
So, so, so the uh, uh, shanks, and this is also a sour mash whiskey. It's a little bit different um, than it's a different mash bill um, than the um, th than the Nectar sour mash. Anybody notice anything different about it? It's spicy. It has more life. Might pick it up. Well, I worked there for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Might, exactly. Mike I mean, worked there for the day. I picked up a lot of stuff. And, yeah. And, 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 Here and, it is, the 10, uh, the 10 year rye that was released. Yeah. The ones that were bottled on June 9th yeah. were the best ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yours, right? I wonder <laughs> why. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> they actually were thrilled to have uh, uh, him and Tappy working there. <laughs> <laughs> but this guy owes us. You owe us a day of work. I know, I know. And you get down there. Um, no, seriously, they, re they really did put it to work in the distillery doing all sorts of stuff. Um, anyway, but th this does have, this does in fact have, have a little more rye in the mash bill. Um, again, sour mash process, a little bit different. And this will be out to the public um, in September. Now the next one we're doing, uh, middle row, second from the left, this is our American whiskey. And you know, as I mentioned to you, American whiskey, the laws are, are, are much looser. Um, Ameri bourbon, which has to be American, you can make it in any American state, by the way. Bourbon, charred new white oak barrel, first use. Uh, American rye, charred new white oak barrel, first use barrel. This, you can use new barrels, we do. You can use used barrels, we do. You could use barrels that you then do a proprietary recharring in. We do that too. Um, so we have a lot of leeway in terms of like our, our cooperage. The other thing that you can do um, is if you wanted to, you can add grain neutral spirits, as I said, up to 80%. Uh, we do not do that. Um, TTB lets us call it unblended because we don't blend in any, any, any uh, grain neutral spirits. It's not a blended American whiskey. Um, so, um, would this be and, your and youngest? And you also can be very creative with the mash bill. It doesn't have to be corn, bourbon, 51% or more corn. Rye, 51% or more rye. It doesn't have to be any particular thing. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, is, it, is this generally your youngest or? No, it, it, it's similar age. It's very similar age to the uh, uh, other US ones. And another thing that we do is we don't necessarily release based on a specific age. We really release to taste um, profile. You know, you know, whether it's parts of the warehouse, or even in the same part of the warehouse, you have two barrels, and you know one barrel is, is great a little earlier than another one is, and so we really rely on, on, on Pam, our, our master distiller, and on Andrea, master of maturation, to tell us when stuff is ready. You know, if we were, uh, you know, uh, uh, if we had, if we had, you know, the pressure of being a public company, maybe maybe we'd be more inclined to be just in time, you know, you know, our 10 year old, 10 years in a day, you release it. Um, um, you know, the, the, the 10 year olds we're gonna taste now, um, that 10 year bourbon is about 12 years, 11 months old. Um, you know, you know, a lot of other companies, 10 years in a day, you bottle it. So you know, but that's, what's that? No wonder it's so good. Well, thank you, very kind, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but you know, we, 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 we give our people the leeway, and you know, that's one of the reasons why we got you know uh, 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 why we got an Andrea from from a great company, and why we got a, uh, a Dan and a Pam from a great company. You know, they they like the approach that we're doing, and they get to do a lot of neat stuff. Uh, but anyway, this is the American. You guys have got to be the leader in using the term American whiskey as opposed to just bourbon or rye. Do you find that that? The products you brand as bourbon or rye sell better, or do you have like uh, consumer confusion with, when it's not labeled one of those two? It's a really good question. I think there used to be more than there is now. Um, when we first came out with when our our, our U.S. one bourbon and our U.S. one rye are our two best sellers, and they basically you know thank God both sell well and they're like neck and neck. Um, um, American, when we first came out with it, it was almost like a fist fight to get people to try it. You know, we'd be at these tastings and people knew Nicktoon's rye and they know Nicktoon's bourbon, they come over and say, hey, would you mind tasting, you know, the American? We always try to get them to taste the American. And sometimes, like I said, it's almost like a fist fight to get them to try it. And then they'd be bringing their friends over to taste the American. Um, um, 
So it, it absolutely, because it's not as well known and because when most people hear American, they don't think of an unblended American like us, they think of a blended American. And again, those are for what they are, they're good products, but it's different than this. Um, but it's, it's been a lot of education, but it, 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 uh, I, th I think that there's less confusion now, a lot less than there was 10 years ago. Scot you know, scotches or whiskeys, I still love this product. Now, mm. the next one, is our is our uh, ten year uh, uh, single barrel rye? Um, this was released in July. Uh, to in, in the U.S. it was the first one released in July. This is this is just about twelve years old. This release. Not New York. That, uh, oh, New, New York. New York didn't yet. You're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, New York. They have the industry shut down. And, and and with the industry shut down, the distributor we asked if they could please release it. In, uh, we always get everything last. Yeah. New York gets everything last. We're used to it. So, yeah. And this, you so know, oily. And, and it's like, you, well, describe it, please. That's a great description. I mean, it's, it's, it's that oily viscous that we're, you know, and this is sets it apart, I think, from so much other stuff out there. Okay. Yeah, Especially when it comes to viscous rise. is yeah. category. Like, you guys own that, in my opinion. The finish is longer than anything else. A lot else of that is 103. The 103 really contributes to the mouthfeel uh, on this stuff. But but yeah, I mean we, I mean I'm thrilled with how this one came out. I mean, and again, you know, guys, we're we're, we're a Kentucky style rye. Uh, there's a lot of other really good ryes out there. You know, the, the great Indiana ryes, but stylistically they're different. It's not our style. We're Kentucky stuff. Indiana rye, a lot of them are at least 95% rye um, in, in the mash bill. And it's almost like, you know, like it, it, let's say that you love a really hoppy IPA. You know, you love that. It's a great flavor. And, you know, the 95% rye are excellent products, but stylistically, it's like just like really spice, spice, spice. This is a Kentucky style rye. I, they don't want me to give out exact mash bills, but it's nowhere near 95% rye. Um, obviously it's a majority rye, but it has a fair amount of barley malt. Barley malt, by the way, is the most expensive of the distillage grains in Kentucky. Fair amount of barley malt and a fair amount of corn. Um, so it's a Kentucky style, so while it has a nice rye spice, it also has like a richness uh, and a little bit of sweetness that you might not get uh, it, it's from a stylistically different. No, it's very sweet compared to a lot of rye. And, and going back to how you said, you know, initially you just wanted to start doing rye. Yes. As, as, is this like your baby, in, in a sense? Is right. this like your ten years? You're like right. This well, is, you know, and, 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 and it's very funny. You know, we we've actually released we've actually released you know we haven't for a few years twenty five year rye. Well, I mean that's off the charts. Yeah. But Chuck Cowdery, who I respect tremendously, you know, he has said to me that he thinks. If you hold rye too long, you know, eating sort of the sweet spot for rye is really more like around seven to twelve, you know, uh, rather the closer than like twenties and this and that. Again, again, you know, and, and, and again in general, you know, one, one of the things too that one of the reasons why our older stuff, you know, I think has been received the way that it is, is that we don't necessarily hold stuff, like when we, as part of our 25 year program, we don't know how much we're gonna have. We know how much we're laying down for it, but we don't know how much we're gonna wind up with because our people call 17 years or so the fork in the road point. You could have two barrels right next to each other, one gets better and better and better, the other starts getting too woody. Now remember, we're not scotch. We're using the tea bag the first time. You know, you know, you get a lot of flavor, a lot of stuff from the wood, you know, in a first juice barrel. Um, and we don't know why, but barrels will age differently. And what we do, when I mean, you, you've seen it, when you visit the distillery, you'll see people say, why do you have stainless steel barrels? And we have, we, 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 if, if our people sense, and we, as it gets older, after 15 years, instead of tasting lots maybe once or twice a year, we taste them at least four times a year. And if they sense that something is at its peak, and if they sense it's gonna start getting woody, they will take this one wood barrel, that's say 18, 19 years old, and put it in one stainless steel barrel. 
it's still single barrel then. Um, as far as as far as as far as TTB goes, if we keep it in that stainless steel barrel for a hundred years, it's still 19 years old. They, they look at how long it was in wood, not how long you you hold it. Um, but it won't get too woody. So the barrels that get to be really old, like some of the barrels in the celebration, uh, the bar the barrels like like in our 25 year bourbon, which which we don't have now, but Woolies. You know, Woolies was selling it in, 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 in LA for uh, 10,000 bottles. Um, you know, the bottles that survive and our, survive our, our, our process to, to last that long, they're pretty good. So, um, yeah, it's an understatement. Yeah, very, very kind. <laughs> and so, this is the 10 year bourbon. It's a 10 year bourbon at, at far right. And almost 13 years. Correct. 12 years, 11 months. Smell, you always smell the difference versus yeah. here. Is this the 18 years as well? Yes. I think it is. I'm pretty sure it is. Yes, Lou? Yes. Uh, I've had quite a few of your older offerings. And is it that selection process that really, uh, because between uh, really Michter's and like Willet, they're the only ones that seem to be able to go 20 plus years without tasting overly oaky? I mean, it's really str big struggle for most brands not to have the oak overwhelm, considering their new oak. Yeah, I mean, no, it, 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 it's a it's a really <clears throat> it's a really it's a really good point. Um, I think you know, look, when 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 you're using a first use barrel and it's 20 years old, you're gonna get some wood. I mean, I don't care you know, what it is, you're gonna get some wood. However. You know, there can be certain products, and, and, and we've experienced it, okay, when we've, you know, made a mistake and we don't bottle it. There's certain products. It's like biting into a piece of old wood. You get the wood, but you don't get any of the richness. You don't get any of the sweetness. You don't get, I mean, just, it's like a one-dimensional, just woody thing, and it's not very good. Um, and and, and that's, that's a danger. Like I said, you know, older can be much better. But when it comes to first use whiskey, first use barrel whiskey, it's not always better. It's not automatic. So a lot again, it comes into we let our people decide. You know, okay, well this this barrel can continue, and this barrel, you know what? Let's be happy with a great eighteen year old. You know, and, and, and we'll either we, we, if it's a great barrel, we may use it in some of it in celebration. If it's a great eighteen year old barrel, we may we may just sell it off as, as ten year. You know, so. Can you let us know when you do that next time? <laughs> <laughs> Come to the 18 years and 10 years. Well, um, you well, mentioned that the rye is a single barrel rye. Correct. Right. But, and you also mentioned it's uh, 12 years old? Or? Uh, this, this it just depends on the vintage, right? This is just about 12. But how, co how come you, you still put the 10 on the label rather than labeling it exactly this single barrel, this was dumped then, it's, so on and so forth? It's a great question. Um, Again, you know, not all the barrels age the same way. And I, I, I had this talk originally with this, this gentleman I was talking about before, Dick Newman, who run, you know, the president of Boston Nichols. And he said, Joe, you know, rather than 12 year or four, just, you don't want to confuse people. This is my 12, this is my 14, et cetera. Just, his idea was just say 10. He says, you can put, you can always put older in the bottle, that's legal. You can't put younger in the bottle, you know, you go to jail. Um, but but um, basically this gives us the leeway, you know, if there's a if there's a really if there's some barrels that are, you know, ten and a half years old that are excellent, we might we might th this particular lot is close to twelve. Mm -hmm. But but you know, if we have a lot that's just fantastic, you know, a ten years, seven months, we'll sell it as tenure. Um, you know, if we, there, there are other times, I mean, our, our 10 year bourbon, you know, Willie got his nickname Dr. No because Steve Ziegler, our sales guy, you know, just threw a fit. Um, we had stuff that was 12 year old, 10 year, 12 year old bourbon to bottle as 10 year. We hadn't sold, we hadn't given any to our distribution system for a year. Um, you know, you know uh, accounts, you know, Four Seasons Hotels and accounts, great accounts that you, 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 know, you, you want to thank them for being in there. They're pissed at us for not selling it to them. Um, and Willie said it's going to be much better in two years. This is 12 year old stuff. And, and, and Steve just lost, you know, you're blankety blank Dr. No all the time, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and that's where he got the Dr. No name. 
we held it to so 14, 14 years. Of the 15 year runs. It, it was, it was, it was no, we had to be, we had to be, well, I don't remember the exact year, but it was. Because it was one year we did the vertical of five. Yeah. We were there last time. Yeah. And that was one of the most, that was the biggest standout. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Was that one year? It's amazing. And, and, but, 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 and so, but, but then, and then, and then New York Magazine did a blind tasting of bourbons, and 12 really good bourbons. Yeah. Um, we finished number one in blind tasting. So Steve sent it to Willie. That's what the stuff that was 14 years old. Steve sent it to Willie. Mick just tenure finished first, and, uh, and and Willie sent him back with a note. This is why we wait. Wow. So you know, so it, it it gives you leeway, you know. But you know, our ten years are usually at least 11 years old. But the backtrack of that point, the other thing amazing I found out is how consistent the product is. You were very kind. tasting with Pam. Very kind. And. Outside of that one year that was a little bit of a standout, the rest were all so consistent that we couldn't agree upon which one we liked the best. It's a really you guys, consistent product here. When you guys are basically starting from square one, you're putting yes. your eyes and you're starting with your yes. eyes and your bourbons. Is there a set course saying, okay, these are gonna be for the 10 year, these are gonna be for our regular US one, these are gonna be for the 20 year, or is it just all as the process goes, so you know what? These are probably going to be shooting for more for the 10 year as you go, or if I said, hey, you know, this might make it for the 20 year, the we're, 25 we're, year. We're, we're, you know, we're, that, that 10 year raw year tasting, um, same, same mash bill, same yeast as the US one. It's yeah. just over. Just about double the age. Um, um, you know, we, we don't say, okay, well, we're gonna to plan to age these barrels until they're 25, so we're gonna make them really differently. Mm -hmm. um, we have, we, again, we experiment all the time, and, and, and some of the experiments, quite honestly, they're god awful, they're terrible, <laughs> so we don't release them. Uh, but then once in a while, like the American, once we get an experiment, like, oh, this is, we like this. You know, so then you do it. Um, but but, but, but tip, typically our bourbons are the, you know, we go with, we're making, you know, one mash bill and you know and, and then rise one mash bill. There's some folklore too around like your 2012 10 year bourbon was maybe closer to the 20 than than not. That was more 16, 18 than 20, but you still bottled it as a thing. If, if I answer it and I get fired, would you give me, give me a good job? <laughs> I'll, I'll be I'll careful I'm recording this. <laughs> we'll share the bottle that I have. <laughs> Just let me know which parts to edit out, all right? I thought you were the boss. <laughs> so ne next, bottom left. But it could be up to you. Bottom, bottom, bottom left <laughs> is, our, is, is, our, is, is Bomb Burgers. Um, this is, and this is, this is, this is, uh, we released, did one release of this so far. Have you had this one? Oh, I've, I've had the wax top that you guys released. Okay. The, yeah. new, the next one that yeah. you released, which was the original, the, the new label, and now this is the new one, so. Yeah, I did, I did two then, weeks ago in Kentucky. Yeah. And so, and so this, this is, this is, this is a different, a different mash bill and a different yeast than our 10 years ago. Than, that is a little different mash, but a little different yeast than the, uh, quite different yeast. What's, the, the, what, what's the age on the bomb burgers usually? We or, don't release the age. This is actually or, about 10. Oh, it is? But we, we don't really, we don't, we don't, we no, don't, make, we don't, make, we don't make any age statement claims on it, but yeah. I believe, I believe this bottling is around 10. Damn. This is your highest proof stuff you This is 108. Yeah, what made you guys jump? Because originally when you released the shanks and the bomb burgers wax tops, the proofs were lower in the wax tops. And then the, when you guys re-released, which was not for another three or four years, you well, we released a year later. No, the original wax tops were out in like 2013, 14. Not yeah. until like two years ago did the did the re-release go out, right? Yeah. 17, 17 did the re-release of the Bomber re go out. Of this, and the wax tops were like your 2014. Well, we, I, we, might have, we might have been wax top more than a year though. You think? Yeah, because yeah, when I when I originally found that one originally, and I was like Bomb Burgers, and I kind of started to piece together where it was coming from. I mean, I, I bought every bottle I could find. I, I, I luckily have quite a few of them still. And I Thank drink you. them regularly because they're fantastic. Thank you. That's why I was wondering why you went from 100 proof on the wax tops and you moved it to 108. What, what changed there? What was the mentality behind the change? Ba ba basically, at the distillery, the tasting panel really liked it at this proof. Oh, oh. It's as simple as that, you know. Did you prefer can, the other one? Be honest. I, I, the wax top to me is there's something so special about that <coughs> bottle for some reason, and like the, and I pie. and I still and loaded up on these two because I really enjoyed that one away as well. But for some reason with those wax tops, there was just there's something yeah. about that juice that I'm like, man, 
man, this stuff is ridiculous. I don't know what's going on in this yeah. bottle, but it's fantastic. Well, it's got like that funky, yeah, it's that funky, white, yeah, old yeah. stuff. To, I don't know, there's something. Yeah, it's so good. 108 proof. It drinks like a 90. It's so a good, the 108. Yeah. Well, Pam. I'll oh, come over and I'll let you know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Forgot the last time. Don't Pam, <laughs> Pam was uh, Pam was 2013. I mean, I meant to say took over from Lily in 2017. 16. 16. 16. Okay. 16. So, yeah, she joined. She joined us in 2013. Would you guys, for, for the wax stops, didn't really recognize that that was part of your portfolio, did you? That Bob Odis and Shanks were a mixers. Okay, let's let the gentleman finish the okay. testing. Okay, so, um, especially now the rush to the next one, yeah. This is so <laughs> transparent, <laughs> Eric. Get one of the next ones. We need another one of those. You want to taste one? You want to taste one? You want to taste one? Taste this one. This is this is the only bourbon, regardless of proof. This, this I, I'm on my two and a half bottle of this celebration. Celebration. Wow, wow. Wow. And it is. Eric, can we it, all come? I've had house? I've had more Michter celebration than any other Michters, wow. and it's because it, than I, any other person it must yeah, be yeah, nice. Very nice. How are you doing? Well, he's celebrating. Wait, what's your address? You know the you know the Voltaggio brothers. Uh, you know the famous chefs, uh, uh, Voltaggio brothers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they had they opened up a steakhouse at the MGM uh, National Harbor, in Maryland. Right. And they had a uh, price gaff, where they were po they were selling one and a half ounce pours of Michter Celebration for one hundred and twenty five dollars. Wow. Really? So what? I bought nice. two bottles by the pour oh, yeah. before they cracked it, and tipped the tipped really? the bartender wow. twenty percent. On bottles that they didn't crack, He's and paid too much on half of wholesale probably. Like so, um, good move! Wow, big move. But so it is it, it. This is the only yeah. bourbon. Are you allowed back into that restaurant? <laughs> that they're out. That I actually put Somebody water. Somebody got into. fired because the nose. Right back, thing, yeah. The nose after you put a couple drops of water, it's it's incredible. It opens up more than any other. Uh, whiskey you put product. Michael's tears in it. I almost. I almost. I'm sure they got some sort of deal. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> Thank you for sharing yeah, the story. That, that, that really is a pretty amazing story. Well, that 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 is the lowest price I've ever ever ever. Heard. I knew the mistake, and I. Yeah, they didn't know. I didn't care. I, mean, I, I won't name names, but they're, 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 you know, one of my favorite places charges seventeen hundred and fifteen dollars a shot for this one. Um, so anyway, th th this is our celebration. Um, when when Willie and I did this for the first time in two thousand thirteen, um, we started working on it in twelve. Um, and basically, you know, th this release at the time at the time we did this, we had about thirty three thousand barrels of inventory, um, and. And we literally picked six barrels. Our team picked six barrels that we thought were really exceptional. Three were rye barrels, three were bourbon barrels. Um, the youngest was, I think, about 11 years old or so. The uh, oldest was 32 years, 11 months. Um, and, um, and, you know, and, and, and it's interesting to me, I'm sure you people know more about blending because of scotch than I do, but, but one thing I learned you can have this bourbon, it's really, really good. You mix it with this bourbon, they're worse together. You know, eat this rye and it's great, and this bourbon and it's great. You mix them together, they're worse together. So it's not just finding great barrels, you have to find great barrels that marry well. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, and our guys, I think, did a really terrific job with this one. You know, and it, you know, it's, it, this, is, this is what, 116? What's the Yeah, this is a 2016 release. We release this like every three years or so. And um, this is the 16 release. And this, you know, this, this, you know, great nose. Wait, wait until you drop some just water in. Coach your tongue, just sits on there for Just be prepared when you, know, when you drop water. But there's so many different flavors going on. You know, it, it, for 116.8, it's smooth. It's delicate, yet it has some wood. It's not overly woody. Um, you know, I think, I think, as I said, I think we're very proud of it, and I think the guys did a good job. When's the next release? Two thousand. We're talking about maybe nineteen. 19. Maybe we're not sure, but we're, 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 we're discussing internally. Um, 
We're actually talking about it today. We're talking about discussing the town meeting. And is it always six barrels? Well, six, six different six different whiskeys. Okay. Six different whiskeys we put together. Great but th this is this, uh, this is what I thought millions. fell in love with it. It's so com it is the most complex. It definitely has the longest finish of ever yeah. done on American whiskey. It's pretty interesting. I mean, just a lot. You know, you know, you, you, you'll you'll get you'll get you'll get you know you'll get you get orange beer along. You fell in love with it. You get two and a half bottles to try at a bargain. I fell in love with it. Um, the first Michter celebration I had was at the Trump International, and it was free. Uh, the director of uh, food and beverage, who I just met. Right, the, the, the one in DC, or yeah, the one in DC, oh. gave me a, a, a half ounce pour for free. They were selling it at like twelve hundred dollars an ounce. And well, what is what is the front line? Good stuff, right? What's that? What's the wholesale? Uh, it's about six thousand dollars a bottle. So, so retail ten. No, no, no. I, six thousand dollars a bottle. It's about four. It's about four thousand. I tell everyone. Now, now we're going to, now we're going to uh, uh, two other things. So I can get you guys a little food. Um, <laughs> now, now. Ah. Excuse me. <laughs> Too good. This is our this is our barrel strength US one rye. It's a little over six years old. It's not that old. But uh, uh, Paul Packold, who Forbes called America's <laughs> foremost spirit expert. Packled, rated, it was either the top 20 or 25 spirits he's ever tasted in his life. Uh, this was this was his top rated American rye he ever tasted. I got a question. Please. I know you guys released a barrel proof bourbon in Kentucky, I think. That's right? Kentucky. Only. Yes, they did. I know, you know about it. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, is there ever going to be a future release elsewhere, or... Right, ever, 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 ever is a long that. time. Yeah. Every a long yeah. time. Yeah. I, 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 would, I, would, I would assume. I would assume so. Um, we were we were asked uh, Kentucky Bourbon Affair down there, which the KDA, which we're a member of, the KDA puts on, and they asked us to do something really, really special, and we did. And we we have you had it? I don't know because I'm in New York. So well, when you come down, you know, <laughs> we, come down and we'll get you some. Um, uh, but that was a Kentucky only release. We're, we are, we, I mean, it, it's not marketing BS. We are so short on goods. Um, I mean, Ziegler, who does our allocating for the world, was whining. Yeah. I mean, you, you guys probably Very crying. He was really upset at the last meeting. There's certain markets around the world that we really consider key markets and are trying to feed as we grow. You know, there's certain markets that get the same amount of mixers that they got 12 years ago. Whereas a market like New York, a market like London, a market like you know Shanghai, we're allocating them more because they're just they, they've been there. so good to us, and they're kind of you know markets that the rest of the world looks to. Yeah. Um, so New York, we've been doing more and more, but we just, we were just we were genuinely we're, we're genuinely short. We are genuinely short. You should, um, every hotel too. You know, every hotel, restaurant wants, you know, you have the cocktails being made, it's... No, they want to kill you, you know, I mean, I mean, they're doing you a favor by putting it on and then like, oh, by the way, we don't have it for you, it's not, it's not a good conversation. <laughs> it can't be a well... It's not know, a good conversation. Yeah. Um, and the last thing? Yes? <laughs> okay, so go, go ahead, go ahead. John? Uh, just to give you the barrel strength uh, numbers on these two, the last two. The one that we just had, the barrel strength rye, came in at 114.8. Which is very, which is about as high as our six-year-old will ever get. And, and the second one, the toasted barrel strength, uh, the toasted barrel finished uh, barrel strength rye, uh, came in at 111 proof. And this, but this is the first release of the barrel strength toasted, no? Yes. Of the rye. Correct. Yeah, correct. No, that's correct. That's correct. So yeah. That's one of the and and we, we, we did, we've done, we, 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 we do a lot of experimentation. I mean, we actually deal with five different barrel companies, and we're always experimenting. Um, and um, and one of the things was, it, and obviously it's not just toast, it's all sorts of different levels of toast. Um, our toasted barrel bourbon, we did for a couple of years, just flew. Then a 14, 15. Flew. Um, and, and we're thinking that, we're thinking, we're, I, I'm hoping we're going to release some again this year. It was the first time like three years or so. Yeah. Um, but this did really well for us. And this, you know, here, here we take our fully matured barrel strength rice. Is this stuff? A little over six years old. 
we put it in a second barrel that's been toasted in a particular way, but not charred. And we put it in there for a certain amount of time. And I was, I, I love, I love Willie. Um, we were, um, one of the great things about Willie and some of his generations, you never know what the hell they're gonna say. Um, and so, and so we had this big pep talk that was top secret. We weren't gonna say like, you know, for a toasted barrel of bourbon, we were gonna say how long it was in a toasted barrel, blah, 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 blah. We all agreed, you know, with the pinky oath, you know, not to, not, not to do it. Guy, I mean, literally 15 minutes later, a guy sticks a microphone in front of his, and I say it because it's public. He says, oh, 28 days. So, oh, <laughs> in the, oh, in the Will, toasted Will, barrel. Will he say that? Yeah, <laughs> in, the to in, the to in the toasted barrel. And we were shocked. <laughs> And, and, and it, 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 it the, uh, depending on the release, it varies um, how many, how long we keep it in the toast. But we were shocked. What we thought for the toasted finishing, we thought probably six months, maybe nine months, maybe a year. But we were so anxious. After 15 days, we taste it. Holy crap! Amazing. Well, just picks up real, really fast. What's the difference between toasted and charred? Okay, um, charred. Now, now let's say that this is the barrel and both sides are open. You, you charred, it, it's, it's a huge, it's like almost like a massive gas burner. Okay. Like on your stove, which is huge, it's like the size of this chair thing. Fire shoots up. You see fire shoot up through the top, and the back, inside the barrel literally goes on fire for about a minute. I mean, literally on fire, and it does the, what we call the alligatoring, you know. What do you do, char three, four? four what do you guys shoot for on your char? Yeah. Yeah. Twelve, four. Three, four. Yeah. <laughs> you can be fired? <laughs> <laughs> three point five. So, 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 so but we, we, it, it's very particular, and we do do different, we do different, no, we actually do different chars for different things, but we, we kind of have like a fairly standard char, but I really shouldn't say what it is. Um, but the other, but, so that's like a minute, that's charring. You have to do that for bourbon, and have to do that for American wine. What we will do before that is, you know, maybe instead of like a fire, you know, this size, you know, we'll have a fire that, like a little bit of kindling, we're like this size, and it is literally. Sorry, Mike. It, 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 it's, li it's literally. I'm spinning by now. So that's enough to go. <laughs> um, um, I think you would say. Yeah, I'm just going to spin. Which tastes more warming. Uh, yeah, so, more yeah. than it is. And what, what it does, it, it's literally almost like you're lightly toasting a marshmallow. You're sort of keeping away from the flame, but like a light toast. And and it's a very, it's a little flame. You typically use use a little bit of kindling wood. It's not this big fire that shoots up. And 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 typical. If you toast a wine barrel, and it's really used more for wine barrels than whiskey barrels, if, if you toast a wine barrel, or, 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 or would we do a whiskey barrel, depending on what we're trying to accomplish, it's typically 45 minutes to 90 minutes. Really? That's like a really light, and, and, and what happens is, you know, we didn't bring the, I, I should have thought to bring the favorites, but, but it, when, you, when you guys visit us either in the Manhattan office or you visit us in Kentucky, when you when you char, the heat concentrates the sugars in the wood, and you will get what they call in Kentucky the red line. If you ever seen a cross section of a barrel, you get the red line where the sugars collect, and so this reddish brown. If you toast before you char, your red line instead of being this big, will be this big. It's at least twice as big, and what it does is the toasting basically prepares the sugars of the wood. So for better concentration during charring, and, and and so we 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 pay extra for our barrels and get them toasted like a wine barrel because we, we think you'll get better concentration of sugars in the wood, a little richer, a little sweeter, a little smoother. That's what we're trying to stylistically. That's what we're hoping to hoping to get. Uh, this one, this is the same whiskey, but again finished not a, a, a more than 28 days, but. It wasn't a huge amount of time. <coughs> Finished the second barrel that was that was toasted, but not charred. You know, and even, even with toasting, you know, the temperature you toast at, you, know, you, could temp you could toast at a temperature from here to a temperature here. You know, so and, and it can have a big effect on the wood. Do we see a toasted sour mash in the future? Uh, 